Governor Kuroda probably was breathing a sigh of relief. He had a huge stimulus package coming his way. We're talking about JGB yields within range. Could a rally in the Japanese yen derail his plans now? Um, look, I think that, uh, you know, the uh, one trigger for the Bank of Japan to act would be, you know, a bout of dollar weakness and yen strength. If dollar yen, you know, say were to uh, begin to trade in the 95, 100 range, that could really put a dampener to the outlook for the Japanese economy, for Japanese corporate profits in particular. Remember, most Japanese companies are budgeting for an average dollar yen of around 105. So once it breaks that line, that's when the red lights at the Bank of Japan are going to start flashing. So give us an outlook for the Japanese economy in 2020 because we also have the Tokyo Olympics coming up and that huge stimulus package from Prime Minister Abe. How are things looking for the Japanese right now? I, I think, you know, Japan is going to go for gold because you've got both uh, public demand with the fiscal package and private demand with business investment and consumer spending actually on very, very solid footing. So I think that the consensus estimates for growth are way too low. This is a Japanese economy that in 2020 could easily grow by as much as one and a half to two percent. So you're obviously optimistic. What's your outlook for CapEx and where, where's the upside to the profits going to come from? No, you, you make the key point here. I mean, what's new in Japan, what's different this time around, is that Japanese companies are actually reinvesting in their businesses here in Japan. They're not just building factories in China or in India or somewhere else. It's actually here in Japan. That's where capital formation, the upgrading of the capital stock is actually happening. And as a result of that, you know, you, where businesses invest in both productive capital and in human capital, that's where productivity grows. That's where purchasing power grows. That's where the profits are going to start to be coming from. Uh, one of the other things I know you see, I, I mean, no one's expecting inflation to smash through 2% suddenly and miraculously, but I know you identify good deflation in Japan. Can you explain what you mean by that? No. No, this is the key point is, I mean, we've got good deflation. Prices are falling while profits are rising. And that's exactly because Japanese companies are becoming more competitive. The, uh, you know, the dividends of the new capital expenditure, the dividends of new internal processes are coming through. And as a result of that, you actually find prices falling while companies are actually making new profits. So that's a win-win situation for everybody. It's good deflation inflation and makes the Bank of Japan extremely happy. Do you think so? Then why are they obsessing over that 2% inflation target? Well, nobody is obsessing at the Bank of Japan about a 2% inflation target. The key issue, you know, if you want to talk about price developments, the key issue here is wages, uh, you know, because you do need to see more momentum that the tight labor market is actually beginning to feed greater purchasing power in terms of nominal wage growth. That's going to be the key focus of Prime Minister Abe and the administration over the next couple of months. As you know, every April, the base pay negotiations get set. Last year, we got a very disappointing, just below 2% increase in base pay. This year, I hope that we're going to go to at least as much as 3, 3.5%. Three that would give you confidence that Mr. and Mrs. Watanabe are going to be out there actually releasing that spending power. Yeah, we are looking ahead to those Shinto negotiations, right? So let's talk about Abenomics and the three arrows, because it seems we have the fiscal <laughs> policy coming through. We have monetary easing, of course. Where are we on the structural reform? You know, it's very interesting. I think that from the government side, you know, there is little, little steps. It's like running a marathon, not sprinting, you know, to achieve the goal of structural reform here in Japan. Let me give you an example. Um, they've just recently changed the rules and the taxation codes, you know, uh, to facilitate more M&A activity in Japan. Now, that's a small step, but the ripple effects through the economy, the structural change that is actually unfolding because of these changes in the M&A laws are going to be very, very positive in the long run for the Japanese economy. And in fact, I think that for 2020, uh, for, 2020 for this year, an M&A boom is going to be a key theme for investors to watch out for.
Uh, yes, but I really hate to attempt to puncture your optimism, but I want to take a look at this chart here on the Bloomberg Terminal, and it shows uh, export contraction Asia-wide in 2019. There's a number of lines on that graph, but the one I'm really looking at is the red one in the middle. Yeah. We see exports are ticking up for most yep. of the economies there. Japan looking kind of flat. Uh, what's your outlook for exports? It's very interesting. I mean, I'm not particularly interested in the export side of the Japanese economy. I'm interested in Japan, domestic Japan. You know, that's really where the action is. That's where the misperceptions and the gap where that allows investors to make money. On the export side, it's very simple and straightforward. You and I are going to have to make a bet on whether China is actually going to recover and reaccelerate towards 7 or 8% growth. If that happens, you'll find that Japanese capital goods exports will follow um, and actually benefit from that. But that's a bet on the global economy. You don't need to talk to me about that. I'm here to tell you that Japan domestically is actually on a very, very positive upward momentum where a lot of money can actually be made.